Well, I remember that. And um, we're going to do something now which I haven't done before in a webinar. So this is an experiment and I hope it works. Um, I have here the wonderful Gasper, who should just have appeared on your screen. Hello. Um, hello. And we're going can to you do. Hear me? Yeah. Yes, we can hear okay, you. Good. Absolutely fine. Um, so we're going to do a QA session with Gasper. Um, so I'll just introduce him first. He's a cultural and literary historian of the early modern period, kind of specializing in drama, um, extremely knowledgeable. Um, in drama, for, as a performer and as an academic, um, Gashbu's presentation of himself as Satan in one particular production was incredible. Um, so I met Gashbu when um, we were both students at Durham University. We were doing PhDs there, and it's too long ago to kind of remember that. Um, but since then, Gashbu has been a fellow at the Bodleian Knoxford um, at the European University Institute in Florence and has just finished, I think, as postdoc fellow at the Institute for Advanced Studies in the Humanities at Edinburgh. Is that right, Gashbury? You just finished there. Yes, that's right. Thank you, Amy. Um, so do you want to tell us a little bit about your research before we get stuck into your fellow? Uh, sure. I mean, thanks so much for the invitation. I, I realise I'm sort of in a, a kind of position of, of an expert here, but I don't feel like an expert, <laughs> an expert. <laughs> at all. So, I mean, I really enjoyed um, papers um, this morning and you know, I've learned a lot and I think most of you have been you know teaching Shakespeare and Othello for for much longer than I have so I mean my research is kind of um, broadly in in a Catholic community in in early modern England uh, I'm interested in performance and drama and sort of entertainment practices of those community uh, of that community so as as you know, as you're aware, I'm sure this this was a, a minority, a persecuted uh, community, marginalized. So I'm interested in in you know what theatre and entertainment meant for them, and how they constructed themselves as a community, and you know and related to to the rest of the Protestant society in in that time. So it's Shakespeare's time, but uh, further into 17th century as well. Um, but I've obviously also studied um, drama, theatre, um, Shakespeare, and you know uh, I love Othello, and uh, I'm happy to talk about it. <laughs> Great. Um, so if anyone else wants to unmute themselves and chip in, um, ask questions, or you can ask questions in the chat, that is absolutely fine. So you know, don't feel like it just has to be me and Gashbo talking here. Other people can join us, join in as well. Um, I thought we'd start by discussing favourite characters in the play. Um, have you got a favourite character, Gashbo? <laughs> Um, I, if I had to choose, I mean, I think I'm afraid I'm, I'll, I'll be a bit boring because I'm going to repeat what <laughs> some of the, uh, um, you know, uh, Craig and, and Catherine, I think, uh, speaking before me said, you know, I'm also very much fascinated uh, by Iago, um, <laughs> you know, no matter how, how horrible uh, a character he is, but he's, you know, protean. Uh, uh, qualities uh, are just are just fascinating. I see him more as a sort of uh, almost as a pure function of 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 you know of theater of of, of stagecraft uh, even to use um, Craig's words. Um, then, you know he he is in a way sort of this director that that you know manipulates everything, a puppet master. It's a great image thing too. So he is certainly you know a character that I'm that I, I that I like it. It is exactly it's difficult to dislike precisely because he really is not a person. He seems to be kind of empty. He's just this function, right? That, that moves everything forward. So that's quite interesting. Um, but um, as you know, and I was thinking about the scene, um, again, again, I, I, I will repeat things that we already heard. I think it has to be the scene, scene uh, act four, scene three, where we have this intimate conversation between Emilia and Desdemona. Um, where they discuss adultery, uh, you know, female infidelity and so on. And I think there are at least three things about that scene that I, um, that I really like. Uh, one is obviously uh, Emilia's almost uh, feminist robustness in, in defending um, women's rights, um, you know, her desire um, to break out of, of, of oppressive uh, patriarchal bonds. Um, and then um, the second thing would be that, um, nevertheless, in spite of how, how this might be admirable, um, 
the way her monologue sounds and how she justifies female agency sounds to me a bit like Shylock's famous Shylock's um, speech hath not due eyes, right? Um, where, you know, he tries to argue that, you know, the, the, the physical body and, and, and the sensibilities um, are the same. You know, the Jews are, you know, physically the same as Christians. And, and obviously, Emilia is, is using similar uh, arguments to argue for gender equality. And yet, uh, both use this, this rhetoric for sort of mal malicious ends, right? Sh Sh Shylock wants to justify his revenge. Emilia wants to justify um, adultery. So that's uh, quite interesting. So, yeah, so yeah I mean, think of it. I, I know that one of the things you're interested in is stagecraft and maybe Craig wants to come back in on this as well. I think, because I, I love that scene, I think it's my favorite scene in the play, but because it's two women talking together in you know, a private bedroom, does that take away some of the power of what Amelia is saying in terms of this kind of feminist rant that she goes on? Yeah. I, yeah, yeah, I didn't, to be honest, sorry, sorry. Yeah, yeah, I didn't talk about that because mm. obviously we were supposed to have a conversation about, about Amelia in a separate presentation, which I know we're going to get recorded later. Mm. Uh, but yeah, it, it's interesting, isn't it? The only time we see these two women um, together is when they are completely private. And, and, and again, it, it can't be accidental, can it? And therefore, you're right, it, perhaps it does diminish the kind of mm. slightly proto feminist nature of, of what they're discussing. Yeah, do, would you agree with that, Gashbu? Or do you think, you know, it is feminist and in, in, can it be interpreted as a feminist scene? I think I would agree. Yeah, of course, that that matters. The space that they inhabit absolutely matters. But not just that, obviously. Yeah, what also matters is that this Demona deeply disagrees with, with Amelia, mm. right? And she has the final word, actually, mm -hmm. um, which is quite interesting, which I think is one of those moments um, where we see a glimpse of Shakespeare, the moralist, right? Mm -hmm. Shakespeare has this ability to, to, to really hide himself. We don't see him. And he's not really that moralistic in his mm -hmm. writing as his, some of his contemporaries would be. Mm -hmm. um, and, and, and there, but, you know, this Demona finishes um, uh, off saying, you know, um, you know, God help me that... Uh, I do not pick bad from bad, but by bad meant, which, mm -hmm. you know, so kind of, it's like, it feels almost like Shakespeare is, is reminding his audience that, you know, uh, don't follow Emilia's advice, you know, don't imitate bad yeah. example, but learn from, from evil behavior, from, from sinful behavior mm -hmm. in order to become better, uh, you know, sounder individuals in your, in your everyday life. So we see that explicit, um, a kind of moral function of, of theatre in, in Shakespeare's time, Didact didactic, uh, mm. you know, um, which I guess it's also interesting for, you know, when you teach that in school, as you said, Amy, in, in, in your talk, I think that's brilliant, you know, that that's why we teach these texts as well to, you know, to try and actually make students better individuals and mm. that they make a, a real impact in, in the real world um, and that these yeah. texts they help them, yeah. Yeah, of course, there's that. There's a, ma a major kind of argument against that if you take it too far. <laughs> but you know, in a, a kind of nuanced sense, you know, we we teach literature because we love it, but we teach literature because we want people to understand the world that they're living in, and then you know they can make choices from there. Um, Kim's just said in the chat that the the play is a male dominated space. Um, so that moment, that conversation between Amelia and Desdemona needs to be encased. Love that word. Um, the fact that Amelia says these things also means that she must ultimately be silent. So that, that's a nice link to the end of the play. I mean, Gashba, do you think that the, the death of Amelia at the end is continuing that potentially moralistic aspect of the play? Is Shakespeare saying that, you know, women shouldn't be speaking up? Is, is, is that what the ending is about? Yeah, I think so. I mean, absolutely. Um, I think Kim is right. That's, you know, obviously, um, what is great about, I think, drama as a genre is that, you know, various characters get to have a voice. They, you know, they can say things they want. Uh, and so, and that it's in itself is, is interesting because, you know, they get represented, they get representation. So, but ultimately, um, 
Absolutely. Emilia is a tr transgressive character, right? She has no real place in this patriarchal structure and, you know, and, and, and exactly in that uh, it gets confirmed at the end, but also in this scene, as we said, you know, Shakespeare says, okay, wait a minute, stop. No, <laughs> you yeah. can say those things, but, um, you know, you guys in the audience that we, you should not take as an example, you know, this mm. is not how women should behave. So, um, so it's that, it, you know, that claim about feminist um, attitude, it, you know, it's, it's difficult to maintain it. Um, mm. I think, uh, you know, we can, we can um, talk about representation, but, you know, the ultimate um, moral is, is different, mm. right? Yeah, um, Catherine's just saying in the chat that it's an ideal moment for Amelia to tell Desdemona by the handkerchief and she doesn't, which I suppose gives more evidence really that, that it's not really a proto-feminist scene. You know, we don't see women working together to help each other, right? Yeah. We see, yes. And maybe, I mean, is Amelia just potentially having a bit of fun, having a bit of a laugh with Desdemona? Um, because, you know, is she should she be taken seriously in, in that rant? I'm not sure. Um, <laughs> Sorry, someone else has um, asked, are there any notable differences in different versions of the play when it comes to female characters? Um, how, how good are you in different versions of this, Gashbro? Do we want to bring someone else in for that question? <laughs> um, sorry, in different productions? Like different or... productions, yeah. Uh, gosh, I, I maybe someone else would be better uh, suited to, to to answer that question if they <laughs> if they know that. Yeah. Don't, Does anyone um... else want to come in, Heidi and, and Craig? I know that you're really good on productions. Um, are there any differences in the kind of presentations of the the female characters on stage? I haven't actually done that much into different mm -hmm. presentations, but I have spoken to somebody who played Desdemona mm -hmm. um, for for mine, and I do usually bring her into my teaching of it mm -hmm. but um it, it generally seems from what from the productions i've seen it's always done as that kind of tender moment of um sort of female bonding between mm -hmm. the two of them mm -hmm. um uh, craig might know a bit more on that if he wants to leap in uh, yeah not 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 too much really to add to that um obviously i think on a slightly different note i think you came up earlier about the idea that they didn't feel well, they felt they were less fleshed out as female characters as the play yeah. progresses. Um, if anyone's got a massive lit subscription, there's a course on there where they talk about the, the idea that at this point in Shakespeare's career, there's like a dearth of really good boy actors, um, which leads to some of them feeling a little bit underwritten compared to, for example, Lady Macbeth or, or Paulina in Wintertale, who's my favourite female character in all of Shakespeare. Um, and she's a, a brilliantly, almost like kind of Amelia with the volume turned up. And I do wonder if there's an element of whether that that ties into performance history. I genuinely don't know enough about it, but when it was on the Masso Lit thing I was watching, I thought that was quite an interesting idea that the, the dearth of boy actors to play those parts meant that there was almost like a kind of expediency behind some of the, the way that the characters was written. Mm. Yeah, definitely. That sounds like one that we're going to need to look into a bit more. So great question. Thank you for that. <laughs> we'll have to park it and come back to it um, another time. Um, moving on to, to a different question that's been sent in. Um, how, how do you think Othello links to other Shakespearean plays? Because I know, Gashbra, that one of the things you're really interested in is Shakespearean history plays, I think, more so than um, perhaps Othello. What, what connections are there, do you think, between Othello and, and different plays, different characters? Um, yes. Um, hmm. Um, in terms of history plays, well, I think um, uh, probably Richard III would be a good example as mm -hmm. uh, as um, an Machiavellian villain that could, um, you know, be an, an, an interesting parallel um, to Iago. But I think um, perhaps also I, I would consider um, Antony and Cleopatra, for example, mm -hmm. um, another play that kind of deals with the sort of clash of civilizations, if you mm. want, between the East and West. Um, and we have that interesting representation of the other, which is kind of racialized and, you know, of the Cleopatra. And again, the gender issues, uh, the, the, the women being dangerous, uh, dangerous uh, and in what way, you know. Um, um, so um, that perhaps is, a, is, you know, one way to to highlight certain certain issues so explore them further we can also find them in othello mm -hmm. but i also like what 
Craig was saying about the winter's tale. So mm. uh, I was thinking when you when you sent me this um, this question and you asked me, you know, you know, think a bit about this. I was like, actually, you know, the first thing that comes to mind is not really a tragedy, but the winter's tale, where where this kind of same um, uh, same 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 issue is is completely rewritten with uh, with a redemptive happy ending. Um, and I also found just brilliant what Craig was saying about Iago and, and Leontes and their voyeuristic observance of how, um, uh, you know, the, um, well, Leontes' uh, uh, wife is, is, is seemingly um, cheating on him. And uh, of course, uh, Iago observing how his plan is <laughs> um, coming to, to, to proper fruition. Um, but there's, Another thing that I kind of think is, is also interesting to, to, to think about, I think it's, it's Michael Neal actually that talks about this in, in the Oxford edition of, of Othello, is of the importance of the play in kind of historical trajectory in, mm. of, of reading Shakespeare from the 19th century to, to today, that there is a sort of a succession of interest that, that went from, from Hamlet mm -hmm. as a sort of, you know, post-romantic, you know, um, subjectivity kind of focused play to then King Lear um, post, you know, the tragedies of, of the 20th century, um, you know, when, when all critics, you know, searched in, in that tragedy, the sort of nihilistic, you know, there is no God sort of mm -hmm. world um, to from the 80s onwards, you know, increasing interest in Othello, um, where these issues of, of, of race and otherness become become prevalent and have been, um, you know, so so interesting in, in you know debated in in various parts in the in the West, you know, and so uh, the play has really gained ground and um, became kind of one of the, you know, the, the focal uh, yeah. points, I guess, in the in the in the Shakespeare's uh, canon. So that I also find interesting that this sort of um, trajectory mm. uh, of you know the the plays that we are kind of more interested in um, as as a society, as centuries progress. Yeah. But certainly Othello was one of the most uh, admired and popular tragedies in the 17th century. So that's also very interesting. Oh, was it? Is, was, is there a particular reason for that? You know, do you know why people admired it back in the 17th century? Yes, I, I think it's a combination of reasons. You know, it's it's on the one hand, um, the, the, the exoticism, you know, of mm -hmm. of of the black protagonist. Um, there, there are so many um, elements of this play that get kind of re redone and rewritten mm. and restaged in the 17th century. You know, I mean, the also, you know, Dryden's, you know, love and honor plays in a way, you know, stem from, from, you know, Shakespeare's Othello, the same, you know, the, um, and obviously there were these characters of of Turkish sultans that were, um, that Othello it's himself is sort of based on that are um, divided between between love and honor, their duty towards towards state, towards their military campaign, on the one hand, and to their their lover, which they in the end have to get away from, um, normally by uh, murdering uh, mm. the lover. Right. So it's, but this really was. Um, People just love that. Um, it's a kind of a, it's a Baroque play, really. So it's really a 17th century yeah. play. I mean, and, and Thomas Reimer, when he um, critiques the play at the end of the 17th century, he says, you know, it's one of the, it, 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 it takes the, the bell away, is the best Shakespeare's play considering his time. And then he completely destroys it, so to speak, saying, mm -hmm. you know, oh, it doesn't work on so many levels. Mm -hmm. It's just, it's just horrible yeah. he's, yeah. he's got a particular problem with the the handkerchief doesn't he you know he talks about this this trifle you know why does the whole plot hinge on this particular item but isn't that kind of the point that by that point in the play when Othello is convinced by a handkerchief that he's he's gone so far he's, he's been manipulated so much that actually it only takes a very little thing to push him over the edge or am I am I misinterpreting that do you think I absolutely agree with you. I have no problem with that. And also I have no issues with the so-called double time and all of that. Mm. Obviously, Reimer was approaching a play from a very particular, mm. you know, set of criteria uh, from, you know, neoclassical point of view. And he was just like, oh, this, you know, this is preposterous. This is just all over the place. There is no mm. order in this play. 
you know he, he wanted to follow aristotle in classical examples yeah. and then and, and you know he said yeah. but obviously he, his his own plays were you know failures so <laughs> he couldn't produce a better play <laughs> but uh, yeah so i mean one of the things that, that lots of us will teach our students is about aristotle and we'll mention the three unities of um time place and action trying to remember the third one there um do you think there's a particular reason why shakespeare won't have stuck to that why he made his plays much more complex than that yeah that's it's funny that you i um so you still do that <laughs> yeah, we, well, I mean, not not everybody will, but we we generally would start with Aristotle, and then yeah. we would show how Shakespeare it kind of departs from that. Um, I mean, is is that a, a pattern that Shakespeare would have been looking at? Would have been aware of that? Is he deliberately moving away from it? Do you think? Mm -hmm. um, yeah, I think that they certainly would have been would be aware of 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 Aristotle and some of you know the precepts of the poetics, but Renaissance tragedy. Um, you know, particularly English Renaissance strategy has mm -hmm. got really very little to do with Aristotle. Mm -hmm. um, you know, there are much there are other examples that that are follow much more, like Seneca, mm -hmm. so Seneca um, tragedy, which is you know this this lush uh, language that 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 we find also in Othello, for example, in the um, how is it, how is it called that the the Pontus C spe speech or so on. Um, I'm just reading, just reading what it says in the chat. Um, as Catherine says that we're blowing AQA out of the water here because on, on the course that we, a lot of us teach, um, we do a module that's just on tragedy when it kind of starts with Aristotle, you know, and it's, it's quite traditional. So <laughs> yeah, sorry. Um, I think that's, I think that's right. fine. I think it's fine if you then teach Oedipus, yeah. but if you then th teach uh, Othello, mm -hmm. It's a, it's an issue, and because also it, it's not just unities, but then it's also you know um, things like um, like uh, like uh, hamarsha or these sorts of concepts that are not really or that mean something completely different mm. in a Renaissance tragedy. You know, Shakespearean tragedy is fundamentally structurally Christian, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. which is which is quite different. You know, and and the how he understands the the well, which is not really. Um, a, f a fatal flaw, but just you know, missing, uh, missing the mark, um, a mistake. Um, mm. How he conceptualizes this Shakespeare and his contemporaries is more in terms of sin. Mm -hmm. I didn't stand, you know, some some a flaw, some personal char characteristic, a flaw that um, a person has, or some special sin, even right. And mm -hmm. and that's what is that special sin in, in Othello? You know, we can we can debate about that. Um, perhaps jealousy right uh, mm. uh, um, so it's it's more the the what what I think Renaissance tragedy explores more is this um, the state of fallenness of the mm -hmm. post lapsarian state of humanity that you know we are you know, as Hamlet calls it, the vicious mole of nature that something is inside us that make you know uh, we do silly things yeah. Uh, we are we are all sinners so it's really interesting and on the, on the other hand the the um tragedy was obviously uh, meant to uh whip uh, vice and and sin and you know and just yeah. show how you know tyranny is bad how uh you know it really has a kind of really moralistic mm. edge to it and we can see that in othello as well and we can talk about what sort of morals do we you know what sort of uh do we learn through this play so do, would you regard it as something then that's supposed to, to teach us, you know, that we're supposed to take away a message from the play or is it, there's other interpretations, is it pure entertainment, um, you know, the, the whole kind of um, Bacton's Carnival kind of approach, you know, what, what do you think the purpose of the play is if, if it's got to have one? Yeah. Great uh, question <laughs> and very complex one. Um, I think you know it, it. You know we learn different things than Shakespeare's audience would have learned from this play. Mm -hmm. We take the, different things from it, and I think some of the, the the quotes, the comments that you put on your PowerPoint, PowerPoint earlier from your students. You know, I thought mm -hmm. that was brilliant. You know, the, the things that they said that what Shakespeare can teach us about mm -hmm. ourselves, our own societies, the way we treat treat um you know women uh other otherness you know how we relate to to difference and so on um 
so that's all great but if you if you think about you know the 17th century um i think we should probably you know there were different sets. if you if mm -hmm. i actually pen this down somewhere what reimer says you know what sort of <laughs> um morals he takes from it mm -hmm. now he says first one this may be this may be a caution to all maidens of quality how mm -hmm. without their partner's consent they run away with blackamoors right so it's, it's clearly you know it's it's that's the mona's uh um fault mm. that she ended where she did because she behaved in such a way she married below her station to a, a black man without uh, her father's consent and so on and then secondly he says i think quite ironically um this may be a warning to all good wives that they look well to their linen <laughs> yeah <laughs> so this is the handkerchief bit i suppose yes yeah yeah um and then he says, thirdly, and here we come to, to Othello, uh, this may be a lesson to husbands that before they jealousy be tragical, the proofs may be mathematical. So before mm -hmm. they really start raging, they really need to be certain that their mm -hmm. wife is cheating on them, right? Yeah, um, I mean, it's, it's really interesting in the play, isn't it? Because Othello demands ocular proof. And then Iago almost gives him that proof but he's completely twisted it and Othello misinterprets what he sees. So in some ways, Othello does get that certainty, doesn't he? Because it's, it's how he interprets it. And I suppose that goes back to that whole theme of sight that Craig mentioned earlier, that you have an Oedipus and so on. You know, what, what do we see? Um, oh, sorry, someone in the chat is saying, who are we quoting? It's Thomas Reimer. Yeah, um, I, I just put it in. <laughs> if, you, if you haven't read the Thomas Reimer um, work on Othello, if anyone at home hasn't read that, if you just Google Thomas Reimer and Othello, it'll come up straight away and you can read it. Um, it's great kind of discussion point for students. Um, so, and, and Catherine's pointing out there in terms of the, um, you know, look to your linen, the marriage sheets as well, that Desdemona asked to be put on the bed at the end. Mm -hmm. kind of encompassed in that as well um so if anyone's got any more questions do you want to pop them in the chat really quickly um because i'm aware that um we're kind of approaching a break um one question i would like to to cover and i know that catherine's interested in doing this um after the break as well is about the significance of religion in the play so you've mentioned this already in terms of it being kind of a structurally christian can you elaborate a little bit more on on what you mean by that um, well, uh, sort of that one thing would be that uh, within the Christian worldview, um, there actually really isn't any tragedy, right? Mm -hmm. um, we were all saved. And, and I mean, this is a bit more a general problem about yeah. uh, whether there is such can a real tragedy exist in, in, in a Christian society, right? Um, well, of course. Um, George Steiner wrote a book on this many decades ago uh, on tragedy, but um, well, he discusses this as well. Um, so this is one this is one issue. To what extent really things can be tragic? And then obviously this um, this internal uh, the, the the issue of culpability, right? Where does that come from? Who you know in in this understanding of uh, Hamarsha as as sin. Um, and so on but i think um so this is more kind of the structural way of or way of talking about the genre but if we talk about religion in um in othello i mean it's there's so much to talk about obviously we can't cover all of this mm. but um it, it, you know it's so it, it's so interesting how we have that the, the play kind of promises again as i said earlier this clash between the muslim turks the ottomans on the one side and christians Catholic Venetians on the other. So we are supposed to witness this clash of civilization, but it never really um, happens. Um, uh, soon after, obviously, when, they, when we leave Venice, we go to Cyprus, which is the, the kind of the easternmost mm -hmm. Venetian colony in the Mediterranean. It's on the margins of Christian Europe. It's mm -hmm. really significant as a, as a place. Um, and then obviously God's providence takes care of the Turkish fleet and uh, they're out of the picture. So it's sort of the play starts again, right? But this time, um, the, uh, the, this foreign invasion is transformed into a domestic tragedy and we have the, the enemy 
within, which turns out to be to be Othello, who spurred by Iago then turns Turk, right? Mm -hmm. Turn, turning Turk was this a contemporary expression in Shakespeare's time, which basically means gets converted to Islam. Mm -hmm. um, so, um, and this obviously, because he's a Moor, is kind of always inscribed on his skin, on his outward appearance. He is Moor, he is black, he's associated mm -hmm. with Islam, with, uh, with the Turks, with, with the other. And that gradually through play kind of comes to the fore, you know, this Christian facade melts and, and in the end we, you know, we have him transformed into a Muslim Turk or, or Moor. So that is, that, is, that is very interesting. And obviously what is also interesting for us today, even more so, is that this is associated with, with blackness, with, mm -hmm. with racial issue. Um, and, and how from the get-go Iago basically, you know, uses this language of racial hatred to, um, you know, to, to tease out this turbaned Turk in, in, in Othello. Um, and, and then he, you know, completely therefore loses self-possession and, and so on. So this is one, um, one interesting thing. The other one is that how, um, both, both Catholics and Protestants used, uh, Turks, um, in, in, in their own, um, a contemporary, you know, uh, religious controversies. Mm -hmm. For Protestants, you know, Popish tyranny looked very much like Ottoman despotism. For for Catholics, uh, Calvinist predestination, iconoclasm, you know, the hatred of religious images smacked off Islam. So we have Protestants inventing the terms such as Turco-Papism and Catholics, Calvinoturcism, you know, <laughs> so they are throwing this at each other. So, and, and it's quite important if you then think about this and read the play with the new eyes, where in the end you see, um, you see Othello, you know, this, his misogyny, um, which is present, you know, in, in, in all sorts of, so many of Jacobean tragedies of, of the period where you have this, you know, beautiful women um, that are either religiously loved or hated, you know, they are constructed either as pure virgins or damned, uh, whores and you have this um and this you know and, and this idea of of adultery and fornication linked with spiritual whoredom you know which protestants yeah. deemed idolatry worshiping of the images what catholics did you know they uh, um so okay i'm, I'm really this is the long long winded <laughs> but but in the end you know i can i can i can think that we can read uh, the final scene um, or, you know, where Othello is and kills this Desdemona, that he's in a sort of an iconoclast, you know, he imagines Desdemona as a pure statue, as a monumental alabaster, um, uh, which it, it, once it deeply attracts him, but precisely because it attracts him so much, so, so much, tempts him so much, he needs yes. to destroy it. Um, you know, and, and so it's a kind of iconoclastic act that you could compare to a, you know, reformed pro Protestant destroying a Catholic statue of a female saint. Um, so I wonder how much, you know, there's also a critique perhaps yeah. of Protestant hypocrisy and misogyny going on there, but that, you know, there's so much to talk about here. Yeah, <laughs> there is so much to talk about. I'm, I'm really um, sad that we're going to have to, to end our discussion there because we're a little bit over time as it is but that's been absolutely brilliant Gashmer thank you so much for taking the time to talk to us today because I know you're traveling soon aren't you so yes <laughs> we are, yeah. stuff too. um so as I thank say you. thank you so much um and it, it's been great to have you here today so I'll just end the recording